Phyllis. Hello, Judith. How are you? I'm wonderful, and welcome to the Temple Israel of New Rochelle Oral History Project. My name is Judy Pinels, and I'm welcoming Phyllis Slotnick to be interviewed for this program. The date is July 1st, 2019, and we're both participating in the recording of this archive at Temple Israel. The interviewee, Phyllis Slotnick, has agreed to and signed the interviewer and interviewee release dated March 1st, 2019. And with the formalities completed, let's begin our interview. I am looking forward to it, Judith. Great. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up, Phyllis. I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and then my family during the Depression years, and uh, my father was not doing too well at that point, uh, we moved to Belmont, New Jersey, where my mother had two sisters, one in Bradley Beach and one in New Jersey. And we went there to make it easier for my father to look for gainful employment, and he didn't have to worry about coming home and taking care of us. So uh, we moved there. So my early years were in Belmont and a little bit in Bradley Beach, but mostly in, in Belmont. You had told me that you felt being Jewish made you were uncomfortable. Tell Very. me a little bit about that. First of all, I recall vividly to this day walking to synagogue in a very Gentile neighborhood, and my mother was all dressed up, wearing a hat and gloves, and we walked through, and it really made me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not really, we were not prejudiced against, but I never felt it was part of our little community. Mm -hmm. It was a small Jewish community that uh, did embrace us, and uh, my early years were spent there. Did you at home do any kind of observation of Jewish life? Absolutely. My mother lit candles every Friday night. Mm -hmm. My father was the tenth man, and whenever there was a need for someone, a minion. he came. He was. He was. Any any uh, season of the year, he was he was out. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the things I think that contributed to his death was it was winter time. And he was going out, and my mother was warning him, don't go, don't go. And of course, he never listened. <laughs> and um, he, he got ill with that, and yeah. never recovered, really. And, and the values, you've gotten such great values from both parents, really. Both of them were good, honest, decent people. They believed in education. We were not, we were the poor members of our family. My father's family was very wealthy. They owned. Uh, factories, they owned um, uh, gasoline stations, and they lived on Park Avenue, mm -hmm. they lived on Riverside Drive. <laughs> we lived in the Bronx, simply because my father never truly wanted to work for them. Mm. He could have had a position and he could have made yes. a good income, but he didn't want to be subservient to his siblings. Wow. So that's... And mom? You, what about mom's, mom's values? She loved music, she loved reading, she hated gossiping. She would have sentiments to me and my sister was, go outside, it's beautiful, commune with nature. That was and she favorite. communed with nature she did. as well, you she told did. me that. She would go to the park and she'd sit and she'd take her little magazine or newspaper and uh, never went for uh, uh, socialization, she just went for her own pleasure her own edification, so, yes. Yes, you told me that your dad, about your dad's involvement with the Schiff Center. Mm -hmm. That sounded very important. Can you explain about that, please? Schiff Center was a, uh, a synagogue in our neighborhood, off Fordham Road, near the Grand Concourse. It was a conservative synagogue, uh, but they had lectures constantly. They had breakfast Mm. Uh, that he was a very great part of. He would go and get a very early on Sunday morning and he would uh, uh, get the bagels and the locks and set the table with another the group of men. And uh, they really opened it up to the community. And it was um, an educational uh, enterprise there. Like a community center, It really. was a community center. But they had services as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
one of the things you told me your parents gave you a feeling of was I'm the best. You got to talk about that. That was so fabulous. There was nobody as good as as me. I was really the prettiest, the smartest, the brightest, and of course I'm not. But you uh, are. <laughs> it gave me it gave me a false sense of security throughout my life. And confidence. Well, I guess so. I guess so. Uh, but Morty was more realistic, and he would bring me down to where I really was. So tell us how you met Mort. He was my sister's, uh, my my sister-in-law's older brother, and um, because of the age difference, she was the youngest of three children. He was the oldest, and he was away. Uh, he went off to the army, mm -hmm. and she was with pigtails and playing with her dolls. So uh, they really did not have a, um, a friendship relationship. They had more of a, um, he was almost like a second father mm -hmm. to her. Gave her an allowance, and, you know, oh. gave her advice as she was growing yes. older as far as what to do and what not to do as far as boys were concerned. And he, he was a very devoted brother, very devoted son, very devoted husband. So did you start dating him when you were at Hunter? No. When I was at Hunter, my sister-in-law and I <clears throat> uh, were very close, and I had a boyfriend that I thought I was going to marry. And um, the luckiest thing that happened to me was he decided that he did not want to get married at this point. He was going to go and enlist in the service. Aww which was very strange to me because in order to be at Hunter College you had to be a veteran. So that never, there was always a big question, why did you lie to me? Were you a veteran? Were you not a veteran? Yeah. So I never really understood. But Morty was there to uh, pick up the little pieces so it was really very easy very for me. Very fortuitous I it will was. say, yes. He was there at the right time. And then you got to New Rochelle. So tell us a little bit about New Rochelle and Mort's work here and then your work. Well, he was an art teacher hired by, I guess, Sim Joe Smith. <laughs> and he had um, not one particular school. He was charged with the responsibility of, the, of all the elementary schools in New Rochelle. And he would travel from school to school. Yeah. And he was like the postman, whether it was rainy, sunny, hot, cold. He was there with his little knapsack and full of his art equipment and he would go from Columbus School and Jefferson mm -hmm. School and then finally he uh, was elevated to Albert Leonard and became uh, the art teacher in the middle school and then he became uh, the district um, uh, leader and it was he who brought the arts program into New Rochelle. And it was he who brought the humanities program yes. into New Rochelle. Mm -hmm. And he believed firmly that uh, art should be incorporated with music and history, and it should be. And he was so you know? ahead of his time yeah. doing yeah. that. Yeah. And when you're talking about uh, the history of a country, well, you really do have to include the, the music. Of course. The artists. That's our generation, mm -hmm. of course, the performing arts. And then I was lucky enough to work at Davis School when Mort was my principal. No, he was lucky to have you. Oh, he loved you. Wonderful principal. Yeah, so helpful to all the students. Um, so then a little black girl once introduced us. Uh, we had gone to a physician's office, and she was working there as a receptionist. And when we put the name Slotnick down, and she looked, and she began screaming to a friend in the back, <laughs> she said, Here's the daddy of our school. Here's the daddy of our Isn't school. Isn't that great? Yeah, so he, he was did, He did touch a lot of people. As did you. And he never saw color. Yeah. He didn't uh, see people as uh, black or white, and he looked at them, which was also before his time. Yes. There was a lot of prejudice going on. Oh, absolutely. So, um, so then when did you get involved with our temple, Temple Israel? Well, I wanted Bethel. <laughs> because I came from a, a conservative mm -hmm. background. And I knew that my family would be very unhappy with uh, Temple uh, uh, Israel. Israel. Yeah. And I remember, though, telling my mother-in-law, who was especially upset, 
you used to love to watch, uh, what not watch, but listen to uh, the Friday night services on WQXR. Yeah, Temple Emmanuel. And that was Temple Emmanuel. Yeah. And would you know that Temple Emmanuel was a reformed <laughs> synagogue? Well, <laughs> at any rate, they went along with us because at least we went somewhere. And, and that the, was the only place he would be willing to go. And did the children join, you know, the Hebrew school and bar and bat Yes, mitzvah? yeah. Mark was, uh, they did not have bat mitzvahs in those days. They had confirmations. Mm -hmm. Debbie was confirmed at 16, and Mark was bar mitzvah at 13. Yeah. So yeah. They, they were. Now, I know something very important when you first joined was the infamous Young Couples mm -hmm. Club. Please tell us about that. It was a wonderful thing that I'd love to see instituted again, where young marrieds uh, would get together and they would make uh, social plans. And very often the plans involved some religion, but mostly it was a, a, a group of young marrieds who uh, wanted to be together with similar Jewish young married people. And where did you meet? At the temple. Yeah. Can you remember any of the activities that you did as a group? We went to uh, uh, Lake Opatcom. We went to Ogonquit. Wow. Uh, I did not go to many of these things because uh, they, they took place on weekends. And when the weather was good, which would enable you to go to these outdoor places, my husband was in his studio and he was painting. Yeah. So, and he was in those an artist. days, today I would have gone on my own. And in those days, I didn't. And nobody encouraged me to come yeah. by by myself. Right. So uh, I was not really part of it. Yeah, Mort was a fantastic artist. I think was it one of his pictures is in here on the property, isn't it? Here, and he's represented at the White House, and he painted, he drew uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, portrait, which is in uh, the museum, right, in, in, in uh, Washington, the portrait gallery, the there. National yes, Portrait Gallery. I've seen it. Yeah, he's he really. Um, Painting and drawing and art was his life. Yes, I know. And he tried to, I don't know how he did everything. And he used to say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Mm -hmm. And he really fit that bill because he, he had many, many talents and he had many interests. And he also was a good husband and father. You know, he played with the kids when necessary. <laughs> he did not do Little League which he did not approve of. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he did actually right. uh, when necessary. Yes. You had told me when the children got old enough to start dating, you talked about the tradition, about a chain, something about a mm -hmm. chain. Can you tell us that? It was so amazing. Well, I always put a little guilt there and said, we're part of a 2,000-year-old, if not more, tradition, and don't 5, break 000. the link. Don't break the don't link. Don't break the link. Yeah. Uh, I think if the hormones worked against us, they would have broken the link, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. You know, there's no, uh, no guarantee that they wouldn't have. But fortunately, uh, in my mind, they both married uh, Jewish people and um, created Jewish households to a degree, Debbie more so than Mark. And um, it was... Um, it was important, and Debbie's girls were bat mitzvah, and uh, what will happen, uh, Alyssa is, my younger granddaughter is not married at this yet. I don't know what path she will take, right. but at least we try to put the foundation down, and what they absorbed, hopefully, will go along with them. Yeah. And I think grandparents are very important in imparting some of these things. Kids will listen to grandparents and sometimes well, resent it, don't you think, from a parent? We were fortunate because of the kind of daughter that I have. And I'm very grateful to Debbie because she was very inclusive. Yes. And she did include us in all of the activities there. We knew her rabbi. We knew uh, uh, what was going on in her temple. We attended a lot of services mm -hmm. at uh, uh, Temple Shalom in Greenwich. and. Uh, it was uh, an extension yes. of us. And I remember Mort bringing the girls to my classroom after he retired. He must have been watching the girls for the day or something, and he would come to Davis and mm -hmm. bring them into my room. It was so great. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Um, 
right now, I know you enjoy coming to Shabbat services. I love it. It's a very important part of my uh, my weekend, and uh, very frequently, I have a group of friends with whom I, I share dinner with, and sometimes a movie, frequently a movie, but they know that Friday night is my temple night, and I'm not, I don't participate with them on Friday right. night. And when you come, what is it like for you? It's like taking a deep breath and exhaling, and any of the frustrations and the difficulties that I may have encountered during the week dissipates. I, I don't know why. Uh, I'm not, I'm more spiritual, I think, than religious per se, but coming to temple is a very important part of my life. Oh, wonderful. And you've been singing for a long time. Phyllis has a beautiful voice. Who started you singing at the temple in the different choruses that we've had? Was the cantor? Cantor, cantor Reps was uh, one of the ones who uh, encouraged me. And I, um, I sang with Norman Brooks, but I wanted to sing Jewish songs. Mm. And we did mostly, uh, in my mind, as my memory may not serve <laughs> me too well, but we, we sang a lot of, of um, Christmas songs and songs that were not Judaic mm -hmm. in, uh, in history. So I really wanted to be part of a group that would sing from my temple. Yeah. And now uh, with Cantor Schloss, we're both singing with him. And how has that experience been? Different people, but he gives so much of himself to us. And he's a wonderful teacher. He has a, a, a tremendous background in music. And he always stops and will explain. I don't know how much really sinks in as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, but, but he does try to uh, uh, delve into the reason that we're doing something musically. I so. That's so true. Um, I liked what you told me when we first met. You said, music makes the world go round. It makes my heart sing, too. Yes, <laughs> mine, too. Uh, do you believe in God, an actual God? No, <coughs> I believe spiritually in, in being a decent person. I don't think you're rewarded for being good, because if you were, there would be a lot of very wonderful people who would lead healthy, fulfilled lives, and it doesn't always work out. Uh, I don't think that there's somebody, the moving finger, it's not really mm, up yeah. there. I wish I could believe it, it would make life much easier for me, but no. no. But, but I think when you come to temple, the aura of that Spirituality it gives me and a holiness. feeling of peace, yeah. okay. holiness and peace. Yes, how wonderful! And I love to come here, so I'm thankful that Temple Israel is here, and is still a welcoming place for me. And I remember when, right after Morty died, and the first time I came back, uh, Rabbi Wall and Ivy mm -hmm. were coming in, and we, they were walking ahead of me, and they stopped. And they said, don't walk in alone, walk in with us. So I'll never forget that. So. That is so wonderful. Yeah. Phyllis, is there anything else you'd like to share before we come to an end? No, except I'm grateful for knowing you, Judith. You're a wonderful person, and I Thank wish you. you only the best that Thank God can you. give you. Thank you so much. Not just from your kinder. And back to you. And thank you for coming for this interview. It was, it was just my pleasure. wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.